Beloved, as we move into this weekend, the four readings in the lectionary are all tied to the Transfiguration, all the Old Testament readings and all the New Testament readings. If you remember the Transfiguration, it's that moment in the Gospel stories where Jesus brings Peter, James, and John up Mount Tabor, and while he is praying, he is transfigured before them until light pours out, uncreated light, the uncreated light of who he is as the divine son comes pouring out of every fiber of his being and his clothing becomes so white that it is blinding to Peter, James, and John. This happens about three and a half months prior to Calvary when Christ has actually finished everything he came to do. In that moment, as he is in that transfigured glory, he could easily step back into glory, much like the story of Enoch, who was not because God took him. There was nothing else Jesus had to do at that moment for himself. He had learned obedience through the things he suffered. He had lived a sinlessly perfect life. As to the law, he was faultless. There was nothing the enemy had on him. And he could have walked back into the very throne room of glory because he exists in the bosom of the Father and could have simply walked into the throne room of glory to rejoin the heavenly communion in that place of God's abode. But he had to turn around and come back down that mountain. Because while the only begotten Son and the Father were in unbroken communion at the top of that mountain, at the bottom of that mountain there was a Father and a Son that were torn and never had fully been able to bond. And they represent humanity as well. And the healing of our human condition and the healing of the brokenness between generations. But on that mountain, Peter, James, and John were the three of the twelve that got to be eyewitnesses of the majestic glory. And the same God and Father who is the majestic glory that at the baptism of Jesus says to Jesus personally from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now says in the hearing of Peter, James, and John, this is my beloved son. Hear him. This is the one who has been entrusted with all sovereignty, all authority, and they see him in the fullness of the coming of the kingdom with Moses and Elijah, and they see the end of the age before it arrives encapsulated in that apocalyptic vision of Christ in his full glorification. So overwhelmed was Peter that he wants to build three tabernacles in anticipation of the eschatological event that will be the ultimate fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. And yet God the Father says, this is my beloved son, hear him. Because we can't take that vision of the future and simply walk into it until first Jesus descends that mount and for the sake of that only son and father at the bottom of the mount who represent the entire human family, go to the cross and bear in his person all that is necessary because of our forsakenness to reunite us to the majestic glory who is the father. So that in dying, he brings all that corruption to and end, and in being buried, he harrows hell and leaves it harrowed so that Adam dies, so that all who are raised with Christ are raised in the hope of newness of life. When he gets up on the third day and then moves on to the ascension and the outpouring of the Spirit, it is so that every tribe, every race, every kindred, every tongue can be part of that ultimate moment that Peter, James, and John saw as eyewitnesses on that mountain. When God utters 
let there be light at the very beginning. It is the uncreated light himself, the Son of God, who is the, in, the visible image of the invisible glory, whose glorious presence and being fills the creation and overcomes the darkness and is the one of whom John says in his gospel, he is the true light who coming into the world enlightens every man and every woman. And so as they're on that mountain, they have the word of prophecy made more sure. And it wasn't a cleverly devised myth. They were eyewitnesses of the majestic glory. The thought of the second coming was being challenged within the first generation of apostles. Peter says, we weren't filling up your ears with cleverly devised myths and fables. Don't listen to the people that are scoffers, that don't believe there's a final judgment and a consummation. We got a glimpse of it. We had a mystical, apocalyptic experience where we were catapulted all the way into the future. And the majestic glory brought us back into the present moment so that you and I could hear the gospel and that you and I could present ourselves before him, that he might present to the Father a company of people, a bride without spot or blemish. But the God who declares the end from the beginning is also the God who is the beginning and the end. And the let there be light of the divine Son in all the fullness of his glory is present in Genesis, is present on the Mount of Transfiguration, and is present at the consummation because God declares the end from the beginning. And they got a glimpse of all of that converging on Mount Tabor as Jesus was transfigured before them. And they got a glimpse in that of how all of us will be transfigured in Christ at the consummation of the kingdom. And all that is broken will be healed. And all that is out of place and out of sorts will be put to rights, as N.T. Wright says. So, beloved, as we meditate on the transfiguration. Take a moment this weekend and read Second Peter 1, 16 to 21. Do yourself a favor. I realize we live in a day when popular Christianity thinks it's silly to read the lectionary or follow the church calendar. Oh, that's just religious. No, beloved, that's 2,000 years of the family of believers being faithful to what the Holy Spirit has passed down through the lives of the apostles that were entrusted with the faith that you and I believe in and that we wouldn't be here without. Oh, there may be things in the traditions of men we can discard, but the traditions of God, they're vitally important. And in a day when people are looking for relevancy and they want relevancy without a revelation of God in Christ. There's nothing relevant if Christ isn't in it. And if we don't realize that the Christ of glory who came once for salvation is coming again for judgment, we don't have much revelation at all. Behold, he is coming again. And as Peter said, it's good for us to be here. We need to be able to say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Read 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21. Do yourself a favor and ask the Spirit to breathe on you. Put yourself in the text and then go read the gospel accounts in Matthew and in Luke of the Transfiguration and ask God to breathe on you afresh. And thank God that Peter, James, and John have left you a testimony of a word of prophecy made more sure and that it's not of any private interpretation. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And everything will be changed in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye. And we shall forever behold him in all of his glory. Sunday we begin a brand new series 
that's going to build on where we've been and take us further into where we're going as we move towards the season of Lent. I invite you to bring somebody with you and come with a hunger and a passion to worship the one who is all glorious and to ask him, perhaps even as Moses did, I pray thee, show me thy glory. We'll see you Sunday.